Al Capone Does My Shirts by Jennifer Koldenko. Chapter 17, Baseball on Tuesday. Same day, Monday, January 14th, 1935. When my mom gets home that night, I don't mention Scout changed the day. I hate when she says, I told you so. While I'm helping her clear the dishes after supper, Mrs. Kekoni knocks on their door. Phone call for you, Helen, Mrs. Kekoni says. Who was it, I ask when my mom gets back. The Beckers. They want to switch to Tuesdays now. Cotillion class has moved to Monday. My stomach drops. I think I must have heard wrong. So you told them you couldn't, right? I didn't know such thing. I've got baseball Tuesday. I thought Monday was baseball day. It was. But then you said I had to change it, remember? You didn't tell me Scout changed it. You said he'd try. I haven't heard one word about it since then. This can't be happening. It can't be. Can't you call them back? She shakes her head. But you said, I'm sorry. I said I would if I could, but now I can't. Mom, you have to. We need the money, Moose. If I get students, I have to take them. Can't you play baseball here? Can't someone else watch Natalie and pay for a babysitter? Even if we did have the money, how would we find someone who could handle her? We all have to help out, Moose. That's the only way this is going to work. I go to my room and slam the door, but then I come out again. I'm not giving up. Mom, please. She shakes her head no. I go back to my room and sit on my squeaky bed, stewing and reading, but mostly stewing. But being mad makes me hungry. I wait until I hear my mom go to the bathroom. Then I make a dash for the kitchen to raid the icebox. My mom finishes up sooner than I expect and catches me with five slices of bread, a hunk of bologna, and an entire package of cheese, plus one jar of mayo I'm holding with my chin. I'm sorry about the misunderstanding, but B. Trixel said she's seen you playing catch with Annie. She said you two have a lot of fun. Can't you play with her? That's different. It's not a game, I mutter. What about Natalie? You haven't tried playing ball with her in a long time. Maybe she'll surprise you, she says. And maybe chickens will sing and dance the polka, I mutter, pushing open the door of my room with my elbow. What did the, What did you say? I dump my load on the bed. When dad, When's dad coming home anyways? Midnight. He works all the time now, I say. I don't like it any better than you do. Baseball's just one day a week, Mom. Couldn't we work out something for one day? My mother doesn't answer. She goes in her room and closes the door. Chapter 18, Not on My Team. Tuesday, January 15th, 1935. Next morning, Scout catches up to me before I even get to school. Hey, Moose, I've got six and six for sure, but I'm hoping for seven and seven. He talks like he can't get the words out fast enough. There's a kid in eighth. Maybe he's going to try. He's pretty good. I played with him before. Where's your glove? If you didn't bring it, you can borrow mine, he says before I even have time to answer. I look up at the blue sky and pray for a sudden storm or a big earthquake. Did your old team have uniforms? Hey, wouldn't that be something? Uniforms and everything? But how do we pay for them? I open my mouth to tell him, but I close it again. All day long I try, but the words won't come out. By the time the last bell rings, I still haven't managed to say anything. Maybe I just won't show up. Tell Scout I came down with a sudden case of the chicken pox, but that's a rotten thing to do. I'm not a liar, and I'm not a rat. Now Scout's outside his French class talking to Piper. Since when does he talk to Piper? Hey, Moose, Piper says. Scout here's just been telling me you're quite the baseball player. He says you're a lot more coordinated than you look. That's not what I said, Scout said. That's what you meant, though. Piper's long hair hangs in her slanty eyes. Her sweater is buttoned at the top, and she has her gloves on. What do you want? I ask. What do I want? Nothing. We were just chatting, right, Scout? Scout nods. He smiles at her, then looks at me, then back at Piper. He shrugs. She was telling me about those convict baseballs. Exactly. Piper smiles, pleased with herself. By the way, she lowers her voice. We're divvying up the earnings at the dock tomorrow, and you are getting exactly nothing. About time you gave Jim, Jimmy and Annie their cut. What have you been doing with the money anyways? Laundering it? Very funny, she says. I gotta go, Scout says. Bye, Piper. Meet you there, Moose. He starts running, which is how he gets everywhere. I don't think he knows how to walk. Actually, I can't come today. I finally blurt out, my voice barely breaking a whisper. Scout stops. He turns around. What? He asks. I can't exactly come today, I mutter. Scout stares at me. Piper does too. Why not? I gotta look after my sister. So get someone else to watch her. That's what I did. I shake my head. Piper, Scout says, will you watch Moose's little sister? <sighs> Piper snorts, not hardly. Why not? Piper looks at me. She seems to be thinking what to say. Because, she answers as if this explains it. Well, get somebody. I changed all of this for you, you know. I know, I squeak. 
Scout makes it sound like he's in pain. What about next Tuesday? Can't either. I stare out at the field that where a line of girls are practicing archery in their white blouses and long plaid skirts. When can you play? Lunch. The word croaks out of me. I can't look him in the eye. Lunch? Scout shakes his head. He slams his book on the ground, picks it up and slams it down again. What am I supposed to tell everyone? That I'm sorry? That you're sorry? His mouth hangs open. He waits for me to say something. There's nothing to say. He picks up a book. Fine, but don't expect to play on my team again. I go home like I'm supposed to, but the second my mom leaves, I let Natalie get her buttons and I give her as much lemon cake as she wants. I'm not sorry about it either. Chapter 19, Daddy's Little Miss, Wednesday, January 16th, 1935. The next day at school, Scout treats me like a post made of cement. At lunch, I don't even bother going to the cafeteria. I head for the library and eat by myself. Scout's the only real friend I've made so far, and apparently I've lost him already. When I get home, I write a letter to Pete. I'm searching for an envelope when Teresa knocks on the door. Come on, she says. Piper's getting out the money. I'm not getting any, I tell her. Yeah, but we'll get candy. Candy, Natalie says. Annie will buy some at the store, and for sure she'll give us some. Now, come on. You can bring your buttons, Nat, Teresa says. What else am I going to do? Sit inside with Natalie all afternoon? When we get down to the dock, Jimmy, Annie, and Piper are already there. Nat gets right to work matching buttons to feathers to stones like this is her assignment. Natalie, Piper calls. Deep in button mode, Natalie doesn't answer. Natalie, Piper tries again. What do you want with her? I ask, sticking my face in Piper's face. Simmer down, buster. I'm just asking her to help me count. I don't think she's... I start to say, numbers, Nat, we need you, Teresa interrupts. Natalie looks up. Piper hands Natalie the money, rolled up in a handkerchief. $3.20 split four, excuse me, Piper looks at me, three ways. $1, six cents, two cents left over. Natalie rocks with pleasure. Extra two cents goes to me, Piper says, as Natalie counts out each share. Annie and Jimmy discuss what they'll do with the money. A dollar and six cents buys a whole Italian dinner in North Beach, plus a double feature at the movies or a month of swims in Flesh Acres Pool or a bunch of rides on the streetcars, the dinkies, as Annie calls them. I'm just wondering how much they get for SEALs tickets when Mr. Trixel appears out of nowhere. Everyone freezes. Piper's money is put away. Annie and Jimmy's piles are still out. Piper, Moose, Jimmy, and Annie, he barks. The warden wants to see you in his library. Me? I didn't do anything. I form the words on my lips, but keep the sound inside. Teresa takes off her roller skates, but then begins to cry because she can't find her shoes. Jimmy starts hollering at Teresa to shut up. A group of moms and toddlers who have overheard Mr. Trickle's command stare at us, their mouths hanging open. Annie clutches her homework against her chest. She looks even paler than usual. You don't have to come, I tell Teresa. He didn't call you. I have to come. Who's going to get you out of trouble, Teresa says, walking in two sock feet. I'm not in trouble. I didn't do anything. I say, he called your name, Teresa says, her whole face scrunched up. Come on, Nat. She scoops down to Nat's level. Moose is in trouble. We got to go. Natalie in the warden's office. My mom is going to love this. Leave your buttons, I tell Nat. She has most of them out now. If we wait for her to put them back, it will take hours. Yeah, Nat, we need you, Teresa says. Natalie, help. One dollar, six cents, two cents left. Natalie nods to herself, following us. I shake my head in wonder. It's almost as if Nat's a part of our group. We hike up the steep switchback road in silence. The wind blows the eucalyptus trees, a buoy clangs, a boat horn toots. Natalie drags her toes. We climb the steps in Piper's house and file into the warden's library. The warden stares at each of us as we sit down. He says nothing for the longest time. The silence presses down on me. I didn't do anything. It wasn't me, I want to yell. When he finally speaks, his voice is very low. I'm so disappointed. I can't even begin to tell you how disappointed I am. Outside, the gulls are arguing. They sound loud, even though even through the window. I glance down at Natalie, who is sitting on the floor, running her hands over the spines of the books. The warden looks at each of us. He takes a pair of small gold spectacles out of his shirt pocket and fl flicks them open. Out of his pants pocket, he removes an envelope. All of his motions are slow and deliberate. He unfolds the letter and begins to read. Dear Warden Williams, my son, Dell Jr., goes to school with your daughter, Piper Williams. On Tuesday, Dell came home from school without his shirt. 
When I asked him where it was, he said his shirt was to be laundered by the notorious gangster inmate Al Capone. Of course, I thought his imagination had the best of him. But when he explained the details of the operation, I began to see that the idea was simply too preposterous to have been made up. It's bad enough that the great city of San Francisco should suffer the indignity of a maximum security federal penitentiary in its midst without being subject to these sorts of sick and dangerous shenanigans. I am appalled by the extremely poor taste and unseemly behavior of your daughter and her friends. I certainly hope you take greater care in monitoring the activities of your prisoners than you do in watching your own flesh and blood. Out of courtesy to you and your long and distinguished association with my brother, Judge Thomas Thornboy, and the San Francisco Road Rotary Club, I am addressing this letter to you in confidence. But if I should hear anything of this nature, my next letter will go directly to the San Francisco Chronicle and the mayor's office, respectively. Thank you for your prompt attention on this manner. Sincerely, Mrs. Del S. Peabody III. It is so silent in the room, I can hear the air go in and out of people's noses. Warden Williams folds his glasses and returns them to his jacket pocket. Let's start with some explanations. Annie Bomini. Annie's face is so red, it makes her eyebrows look almost white. Her shoulders are slumped and her leg is twitching. Her homework is still clutched against her chest like her arm is permanently stuck that way. I didn't sell the shirts. I put them through with our laundry. It was Piper's idea. The warden's eyebrows wag. He rolls his tongue over his teeth. The one thing I've never had patience for is a person who blames someone else to lessen her own culpability. I can't tell you how disappointed I am to see you behave this way, young lady. The warding stares Annie down. Piper speaks so highly of you. She's not usually like this, Daddy. Piper lowers her voice and steps closer to her father. Like what? I ask. She told. She said the truth. Jimmy stands up. Yep, he says and sits down again. The warden looks like someone has poked a pick in his side. His hands shake. He steadies himself on the bookshelf and then his eyes go cold and hard like something sealed in ice. Apparently, I can't trust you children any more than I can hardened criminals. Well, fine. I'll handle this like I would an uprising in the cell house. All of you will be punished without exception. Even me? Teresa's voice is quavering. Teresa didn't do anything, sir, Jimmy mumbles. Neither did Moose, Teresa said. One dollar and six cents. One dollar and six cents. Two pennies left over, Natalie says. What? The warden looks from Jimmy to Teresa to Natalie. Shh, Nat. I say, two pennies left over, two pennies left over, Nat says, like someone is arguing with her math. What is she talking about? The warden roars. That's the amount left over, I say. Left over from what? From what they earned, Teresa says in a tiny voice. Earned? The warden barks. Don't tell me. This is about money. Money changed hands in this shenanigan? No one says anything. But the quiet is clearly an answer. The warden looks at each of us. Let's have it right here. He pounds his desk every last cent. Annie reaches in her pocket and pulls out her coins. Then Jimmy, Piper doesn't move. Warden Williams looks at me. I didn't earn any money, sir, I say. He glances at the pile of coins, mostly nickels. Why do you think they're locked up? He cocks his head in the direction of the cell house. Why do you suppose, Mr. Flanagan? They, uh... I swallowed hard. Broke the laws? The warden ignores me. He waits. That's right. Money motivated most of them. Is that how you want to end up? No, sir. Annie and I say in unison. I wasn't born yesterday. You aren't the first kids to break the rules. But you will be the last children on this island to ever do anything like this again. There is nothing about this to be proud of. He waves the letter in the air. There may come a time in your life when you feel it's your moral authority to challenge a rule. But that's not what this is about. This is about greed and silliness and incredibly poor judgment. Do you have anything to say for yourself, Moose? Sir, I didn't do anything. That's what I've been trying to. No excuses. The warden roars so loud, even Natalie looks up. How about you, Annie? No, sir. Jimmy? No, sir. Teresa? No, sir. If any like, anything like this occurs again, all of your fathers will be dismissed without severance. Anybody know what severance is, Annie? Fired without pay, Annie Warden. Annie whispers, that's right, Annie, the warden says. He watches her, tries to pull her eyes to his eyes, but she will not look at him. She stares at her hands. Shame on you, he says in a velvet, quiet tone. Shame on all of you. Annie, how do you think your mother's going to take this news? For crying out loud, Jimmy, you think your family hasn't had enough trouble? 
You really want your dad to be out of a job with that brand spanking new baby? Do you know how hard it is to feed five mouths in this world? Any of you? Jimmy bites his lip. I can see the tears well up in him. Moose, I expect more from you than this. He expects more from me? I didn't do anything. I've seen how nice you are with your sister, but then you get involved with something like this. He shakes his head. I catch you doing anything, anything against the rules. I mean, you kids breathe wrong and you'll be asked to leave. Yes, sir, we all say. The warden straightens his coat. It isn't straight already, but he does it anyways, as if the discussion rumpled him. I'll be speaking to all of your parents about this. This money will be returned to your classmates. I will make those arrangements myself. Now get out of my sight, every one of you. And you, young lady. He nods to Piper without looking at her. I'm not finished with you yet. As we file out of the office, I see Piper lean over and whisper to her father like she's his buddy, not his daughter. The little slime. She'll get out of this. She will.